Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire video lectures, and today we're covering the appendicular skeleton. Let's go ahead and begin. So the appendicular skeleton includes uh, bones of your upper limbs and lower limbs, so your arms and your legs, and also structure that attaches your um, arms and legs to your uh, axial skeleton. Uh, and it would be pectoral girdle and pelvic girdle. So pectoral girdle include uh, clavicle and scapula. So that's a clavicle and scapula. And pelvic girdle includes bones that we call hip bone or oscoxa. And it's actually made of three bones fused together, ilium, ischem, and pubis. Okay, so pectoral girdle, I just um, mentioned, right? It's um, clavicle and scapula. So um, on this diagram, you can see a scapula. It's a long bone. It's a horizontal bone. It's actually only one long bone in your body that lines horizontally instead of vertically. Uh, it supports scapula, transmit force to sternum and axial skeleton, and protects nerves and blood vessels. Um, if you look at the clavicle, you can um, distinguish three regions. It will be medial end and medial end attached to sternum, a lateral end that is attached to scapula, and a shaft or body of the clavicle. Uh, the second bone um, of the pectoral girdle is scapula. Scapula is located uh, at the posterior side of shoulder and it anchors upper limb to body. Um, we have several landmarks on scapula, but hopefully all of these landmarks make sense. So we have superior border, so it would be right here, so superior border, uh, medial border, like this. lateral border, over here. Um, suprascapular notch, that is a notch right in this area, over here, superior angle, right here, Inferior angle, glenoid cavity, um, that's a glenoid cavity over here. So glenoid cavity forms joint with uh, humerus, right? So that's your shoulder joint. And it's called glena um, humoral joint. Um, acromion is this process right here. And acromion articulates this clavicle caracoid process. Caracoid process is this one over here, or you can see it's better on this diagram. And caracoid process is a point of attachment for muscles. For example, uh, your uh, short head of bicep brachii um, originate at a caracoid process. And we have spine of the scapula right there. So when you when you touch your shoulder, you can palpate um, the spine you know, pretty good. Uh, we also have some fossa that is not on your list, but it will be important when we discuss muscles like uh, supraspinous fossa above the spine, infraspinous fossa below the spine. And when we cover muscles, we will have supraspinatus, infraspinatus. And on the anterior part of the um, scapula, you have subscapular fossa. So this is anterior view, right? So this fossa right here, subscapula, so here's the name, and it will be muscle called subscapularis. Now we're moving down, uh, we're gonna discuss the upper limb. And um, the bone of the um, arm or uh, brachial region, is humerus. And so here you see a diagram of the humerus and you see human 
uh, humerus bone. So it's located between shoulder and elbow joint. And it also has several landmarks like a head. Um, so, so here would be a head, right? So this area. Then you have um, surgical neck and anatomical neck. So here's a surgical neck. Surgical neck usually uh, lays on a bone um, where compared to anatomical neck. So here's anatomical neck. But surgical neck, this is where the bone most likely to fracture. Um, then deltoid tuberosity. So here's a deltoid tuberosity. And this is where deltoid muscle is attached. Right there. Epicondyles. So here we have like little bumps on a distal part of uh, humerus that called epicondyles. We have trochlea and capitulum. So trochlea is this bone right here. It, it does kind of remind me like a letter T. And this is round um, structure capitulum. So trochlea articulates with ulna and capitulum articulates with radius. And then we have several fossas like um, alecranon fossa, for example, over here. Um, where the head, uh, where the ulna fits. Okay, so that's upper arm and is a brachial region and humerus. So now we're moving to antibrachial region, um, that's your forearm. And forearm is made of two bones, radius and ulna. Ulna is medial and radius is lateral. So here you see ulna bone and to really identify ulna very easily, you see this part of the ulna, it's kind of makes this, it has this U shape. It makes letter U telling you, look, I'm ulna, right? So that's how I um, identify ulna. Right? So that's U. Now, several landmarks. We have, um, uh, trochlea notch. So remember, I told you ulna um, articulates with trochlea. So that trochlea, trochlea of humerus. So the trochlea really fits inside this trochlea notch. So here it would be kind of like a trochlea notch. Um, then we have a coronoid process. Uh, that's this one right here. Um, radial notch of ulna. So radial notch of ulna gonna be right here. This is where the head of a radius fits. Uh, Alecranon process is like this big bump on the proximal side of ulna. And actually, if you look at your elbow, this bump over here, that's a alecranon process of ulna. And uh, radius and ulna are connected through interosseous membrane. So you see the, all this stuff over here, this membrane that connects these two bones together and it unites them, right? Give it more of the stability. Uh, the second bone of forearm or antibrachial region is radius. Radius for me look like a nail. So if you look at this head, it does really kind of remind me um, head of a nail. It's a lateral bone of forearm, has several landmarks as well, like head of the radius. So where you have this, you see this head look like a nail head, that's a head. Then it has neck, neck is always below the head. It has radial tuberosity, right? So right over here, that would be radial tuberosity. Ulna notch of the radius, um, actually gonna be on the bottom over here, right there. This is where kind of head of ulna fits, right? So we have a radial notch of ulna and ulna notch of radius, um, right? So, um, Okay, um, 
So what else? I just uh, make sure I, I didn't forget anything. So radial tuberosity, I already show you radial tuberosity. Um, this is the insertion of bicep brachii muscle. Uh, ulna notch, I, okay, I just showed you. Styloid process of radius is actually this uh, little bump over here, right? And um, this will be the uh, attachment of muscles that called brachioradialis. So that's going to be actually an uh, insertion of brachioradialis muscle. Um, and uh, we already mentioned um, this interosseous membrane that unites ulna and radius. Now we're moving down to carpal bones. Now carpal bones make your wrist and we actually have two rows of carpal bones and four bones, four individual bones in each row. So we have proximal row and distal. So this, um, I'm gonna uh, kind of like not highlight, but just uh, trace these bones. One, two, this is number three, and this is four. So whatever bones I'm, I traced for you, though uh, uh, four bones, one, two, three, four, they make proximal row. And then you have um, another four bones, like this one, one, two, three, and four, and they make distal row. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, pollex because your thumb is a pollex. So we go from pollex to your little finger and we're gonna name those bones, right? So the first bone over here is called scaphoid. Scaphoid means boat. So you have a boat or scaphoid, then you have lunate, then you have triquitrum and pisiform. Pisiform mean, means P, like green P. Um, the second row, that is a distal row, we again gonna start with pollux and go to, towards little finger and we're gonna name those bones. So um, the, the first bone that connected to the thumb is tra, uh, trapezium. So you kind of like, Thumb trapezium. The next is trapezoid. Then we have um, capitate and hemate. And hemate, it's not shown over here, but it has like a little uh, bump over here that make it look like a hammer. This is where the word hemate came from. So again, scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum, pisiform, trapezium trapezoid, capitate, and hemate, right? So, <clears throat> um, and um, scaphoid and lunate, uh, they articulate this radius. So you can see here on, on this diagram, so this, this is our, uh, radiocarpal, so that's, this is a radius over here. And this is our scaphoid and lunate, right? That's, that's our uh, radiocarpal joint or your wrist joint. And triquitrum articulates this fibrocartilaginous pad. So it will be some cartilage, uh, fibro cartilage over here. Uh, distant bones of um, the carpal bones are held by ligaments and form mid-carpal joint. And uh, if you look on the diagram below, um, so that's a palm of a hand, right? And you have a group of muscles here and you have a group of muscles over here. And those uh, group of muscles called thinner group, and this is hypo thinner group. And you see there is a um, connection in between them and it's called um, flexor retinoculum, right? So uh, the significance of this is that um, this flexor retinoculum make um, 
closed, um, uh, like closed space, right? Very, um, you know, like narrow um, space in your, where your carpal bones are located. So you have all the bones over here, right? So you have bones on one side, right? And then you have pretty much connective tissue. So you're making this tunnel, right? And what goes through this tunnel, um, uh, actually the tendons of several muscles and nerves. Um, this nerve that goes through this tunnel is called median nerve. And very often when you use your wrist a lot, like when you work on a computer all the time, you know, it starts hurting over here. So this nerve, median nerve, get compressed and inflamed, and it's caused syndrome that we call uh, carpal tunnel, right? So flexor retinaculum spans top of this area between thinner and hyperthinner muscles. It maintains carpal um, grouping. So it's kind of keeps everything together, right? In your, um, uh, in your carpal area, in your wrist. But at the same time, um, it sometimes puts too much pressure on the median nerve forming a uh, carpal tunnel. That's when nerve in inflamed and it causes pain. Right. Now we're moving to the hand. Uh, so, um, so we discussed already carpal bone, right? So that's your wrist. Now we're, we're moving to metacarpal region. So dorsal side is called metacarpal region and ventral is called palmar region. And we have five individual bones over here, metacarpal bones. So those metacarpal bones, just to make it simple, we call them MC, metacarpal, right? And uh, we give them numbers, Roman numbers. So it's, you know, way, way easier, right? Who came up with this, you know, lunate, triquitrum, pisiform, um, capitate, hemate, this is, you know, pretty difficult to remember. Metacarpals are good. You just need to know that you start counting from thumb, from pollux. And this one going to be metacarpal one, MC1. And then you have MC2, MC3, MC2, MC3, MC4, and MC5. So we have five bones between carpal bones and bones of the fingers. And um, that's where your metacarpals are located. And then we have phalanges. Um, so each finger except of thumb has three phalanges, right? So we have proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx. And uh, pollux has two, proximal and distal. So that's why you can bend your fingers into two joints. So you have like two joints over here and you have only one in your uh, pollux, right? So here we have a complete hand, uh, eight carpal bones, five metacarpal bones and phalanges. Okay, so now we're moving to the lower limb. And we're gonna start with a pelvic girdle. So pelvic girdle is a structure that attaches your uh, lower limb to axial skeleton. And pelvic girdle is made of a pretty big bone. Uh, that we call hip bone or oscoxa. And hip bone is formed by fusion of three bones. And it's ilium. Trying to find where this name is. Ishem and pubis. So here's the pubis. And now I need to find where my name for Ishem. Okay, so that's this uh, orange bone right there, Ishem. So here's the three bones that fuse together, ilium, ischem, and pubis. 
So ileum is the uh, biggest bone and it has several uh, landmarks, but we here we are interested in one over here. It's called greater sciatic notch. Now ischem um, has landmark here that is called ischial tuberosity. And if you're sitting right now, you're sitting on your ischial tuberosity and a lesser or less sciatic notch over here. And pubis, um, okay, two pubic bones, right? So that's, that's a pubic bone um, shown here in a kind of like purple color. So when two pubic bones, um, they join together, they form this arch over here that is called pubic arch. And depends of angle of this arch, we can uh, differentiate between male and female uh, pelvis. So let's uh, get to the next slide. So now we're looking at pelvis. Now pelvis is not part of appendicular skeleton and pelvis is not part of axial skeleton. It's a it combination of both. So pelvis as anatomical structure has hip bones, uh, hip bones are part of excel skeleton, uh, appendicular skeleton, sorry. And then it has sacrum and coccyx. They are part of excel skeleton. So the pelvis is hip bones plus sacrum plus coccyx. Um, and um, we, we will look at acetabulum in a minute because I need to go to previous slide. But over here, we can see obturator foramen right here, um, right here. And we, we have sciatic uh, foramen. Remember, we talk about this, this is sciatic notch. But now when you know, we're looking at the pelvis, we have ligaments here, like this ligament, right? Uh, sacrospinous ligament. Um, or this one, sacro tuberous ligament over here. But those ligaments now form a foramina. Now, this is the foramina that is called greater sciatic foramina. Now, obturator foramina, greater sciatic foramina, less sciatic foramina, all those openings um, are needed for muscles, blood vessels, and nerves to pass through them. Right, so if you have, um, let's say, sciatic nerve, it passes through greater sciatic foramina. If you have obturator nerve, it passes through obturator foramina. And we have, uh, you know, several muscles, um, uh, right, that passes and blood vessels as well. So that makes sense. So let's go back now and look what acetabulum is, right? Um, so I need to go to a previous uh, slide. And actually, I don't know how to, let me, um, I wanna just remove all these drawings, right? So they're not on my way. Uh, so we're looking at this hip bone, right? Oscoxa. Now, um, you see this structure here? This is like a socket. And this is what acetabulum is. Right, so acetabulum is like a socket, and what fits inside the socket is your femur, or that's your um, the bone of your thigh, right, of the femoral region. So femur fits inside the acetabulum, head of the femur, forming acetabular femoral joint. Right, or your hip joint. And you can see acetabulum is formed by ilium and ischem and pubis. So that's all this, uh, you know, three bones make acetabulum. Okay, okay now uh, male versus female pelvis. Um, they differ in the pelvic weight. In females, it's thinner and lighter. Then Pelvic inlet and outlet are different. So inlet is like the superior region and outlet uh, would be inferior region, like this circumference over here. So pelvic inlet shape is round in females. So here's a female and hard 
shaped in males. And this is because the, that female pelvis is adapted for childbirth. So we really need a larger, nice and round outlet and inlet to allow um, baby to go through the birth canal during labor, right? So we want it nice and wide. When male pelvis is designed for bearing uh, um, bigger weight, heavier weight, I'm sorry, not bigger, heavier weight, that, um, that's the, the purpose of <laughs> male pelvis. So it, its function is not to uh, provide the passage for baby during childbirth, right? So that's for female. Um, so pelvic cavity is shorter and wider in the female. Um, now subpubic angle. Um, I like this characteristic to dis distinguish really. It works um, almost all the time. So you see this angle over here? So here it says if it's greater than 80 degrees, but usually it's even greater than 90 degrees in females and it's less than 90 degrees in males. Right then, um, you know, we can see um, if this, this angle is, you know, sharp and, you know, less than 90 degrees, then it would be male pelvis. Um, yeah, so this is how we can differentiate between male and female pelvises. There is, I think, way, way more differences. Those just the major ones. Now we're moving from the uh, pelvis to uh, uh, femur, right, in the femoral region. So in the femoral region or thigh, um, you have femur. Femur is the largest and strongest bone. And landmarks would include head, right? So that's nice and round head of the femur. Of course, we have a neck over here as well. Um, fovea capitus uh, is a little kind of like a depression over here, right? And uh, fovea capitus, this is, there is a ligament, it's called ligamentum teres that connects femur to pelvis. And this is where it's attached. Uh, neck, I already show you, trochanters um, right here. So here's a trochanter. This is a greater trochanter right, right there. This is a lesser trochanter. Uh, and um, those trochanters are for muscle attachment, like a greater trochanter for uh, gluteus, medius, and minimus, and lesser uh, trochantum for muscle called psoas majors. So muscles are attached, they inserted into this bony um, structure that we call greater and lesser trochanter. Then we have gluteal tuberosity and it's kind of like, so it's not shown here, but here you can see gluteal tuberosity. And this is where the gluteus maximum, maximus, that's the biggest muscle of the gluteus group, gluteus maximus uh, inserted into gluteal tuberosity. And linea aspera, uh, linea aspera like a sharp um, line over here on the posterior side of the uh, femur. And um, we also have muscles attached over here, and this would be adductor muscles, muscles that bring your um, uh, uh, femurs, you know, or your femoral regions towards midline, adduct. Uh, uh, then we have patella, right? So patella is right here, and patella is sesamoid bone, and it's lies within tendon of quadricep femoris. So you have quadricep femoris and it covers a patella bone. Okay. Um, then we're moving to um, your leg, right? Uh, the anterior part of your leg is called crura. Posterior part is called sura. 
So, uh, but your leg is made of two bones, tibia and fibula. Tibia is medial and fibula is lateral. So you see that's a lateral, so that's a fibula, right? this one. So fibula is way, way smaller bone. Um, tibia is larger of two and it's main weight bearing bone in lower leg. And landmarks would include um, condyles, right? Like over here, lateral, medial condyles, um, tibial tuberosity. So this one you can also palpate. So if you just palpate uh, your leg just below uh, your kneecap, there will be bunny structure over there. That's you touching tibial tuberosity. Medial malleolus, that's a big bony. Um, projections on the medial side, right? So it would be um, kind of like over here. That's a good one to show on this side, right? And, um, and it has a fibula notch, right? So, so this is where, would be where ahead of the fibula uh, fit, right? So that's a fibula, fibula notch. I don't know if you can see it. I think my my picture was on your on your way, right? Um, but I'll show you right here. Right there. Oops. I don't need this. Okay, next slide. Uh, fibula. So fibula is a lateral bone. We already mentioned that uh, attachment for fibularis muscle muscles. Fibularis longus, fibularis brevis. Uh, it's not weight bearing bone, and uh, landmarks would include head, right? So that's a head, and a lateral malleolus. Lateral malleolus is a pretty big bump. So again, if you if you go towards your um, ankle on the lateral side, you can, you know, you can. Uh, feel this bump, right? Will be lateral malleolus right there of the fibula. And um, there is also a membrane, interosseous membrane, like you have between radius and ulna, you have also connection between tibia and fibula. So here's interosseous inter membrane. Inter means between and osseous means bones, between bones. Now we're moving to tarsal bones. Um, so we already uh, talked about carpal bones. Remember carpal bones, we have eight of them. We have seven tarsal bones. And let's go ahead and look. All right, so let's look at the lateral view um, because I think this is the best one uh, to represent. So here's the largest bone, that's your heel. That's called calcaneus. So that's a calcaneus bone. Then uh, the more uh, most superior bone right here is called talus, right? So that's a talus on top, and talus uh, will articulate with tibia. Now then you have um, cuboid bone. So here's a cuboid right there, right? So cuboid articulates with calcaneus. Then you have navicular. So here's a navicular. Let me just color it. So navicular articulates with talus. And then you have bones that we call cuneiform. Now here you only see two cuneiform forms. So let's go back to this uh, bony, uh, you know, that's a human um, food. Um, so this one over here, right? So that's a calcaneus. On the top is talus. What articulates with talus is navicular. So you see, that's a navicular. Now, um, this bone over here, it's called cuboid. Right, so let's see. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a, this is a uh, big toe, right? So here's a cuboid right there because a cuboid is where your pinky is, and that's your pinky. So cuboid, and then we have three over here. So you see this one, this one, and this. 
So all the three are cuneiform. Now, uh, where your uh, hallux, so this the big toe is called hallux. So your hallux is medial, right? So look over here, you see that's the midline of a body. So your hallux, your big toe is medial. Now this one then will be medial cuneiform. This one will be intermediate cuneiform. And this one will be lateral cuneiform, right? So that makes sense. So let's repeat again. So we have um, calcaneus on the top, uh, that's your heel. On the top, we have talus. Talus articulates with tibia. Then we have navicular that articulate with talus. We have cuboid. It's actually, I think it's shown right there. Yeah, so right there. That's cuboid that articulates with calcaneus, or you can see it here. Um, right, um, so that's, um, that's our cuboid. Right, that's a cuboid. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a cuboid. Okay, so this one is like a mess. So the calcaneus is all this stuff, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all calcaneus. This is, is that what I say? It's not very, very, uh, very good view. This one is cuboid. That's a cuboid. This one. Right, so again, calcaneus, talus, navicula, cuboid, one, two, three, four, and three cuneiforms. Right, so that's gonna be our medial, intermediate, and lateral. So total, we, we need seven, right? So let's count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Be good, right? Um, and the same over here. So here's the calcaneus, we have talus, navicular, cuboid, lateral, intermediate, and medial cuneiforms. Next, we're moving to uh, metatarsals. Now, the same as metacarpals, uh, metatarsals uh, have numbers and we abbreviate with MT. Actually, those are really like Roman number, one, two, right? So metatarsal uh, one, metatarsal two. Uh, and we start counting from big two from hallux, so that will be MT1, MT2, MT3, MT4, and MT5. And we have the same number of phalanges, right? We have three phalanges for uh, your toes and two phalanges for big toe, for uh, thumb. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a big toe. That's a thumb. <laughs> um, so this is called hallux. So this is pollux. Uh, big toe is uh, hallux. So the hallux has two phalanges, the rest of toes have uh, three phalanges. And thumb, right, has two phalanges, the rest of fingers, three phalanges, right? And the very last slide is ossification of bones. And I already covered ossification of bones in the previous lecture. So I'm just going, um, I, I will go very quickly, uh, not talking about any details, but when you were, when you were an embryo, right? When you were not born yet, you didn't have bones. So your bones um, developed by week 25 of embryonic development. And the bones can develop either from membrane or from cartilage. Uh, but membrane and cartilage, they develop from stem cells, mesenchymal cells. But so first you have a membrane and if bone is formed from a membrane, it's called intramembrane ossification. And bone that goes through intramembrane ossification are flat bones of the skull, mandible and clavicle. So those mesenchymal cells that are stem cells, they differentiate uh, directly into bone producing cells. If uh, we're talking about all other bones, right, in your body, so all bones of the appendicular skeleton except clavicle, right, um, 
then they develop through endochondral ossification. Then these mesenchymal cells first gonna form a cartilage model, and then the cartilage will ossify uh, and form a bone, right? So that's pretty much uh, what this slide is about. And look at this cute embryo over here. Just amazing. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's it for this lecture, right? And we covered the appendicular skeleton. Thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.